Hi, everybody. We're going to start in just a few moments. I'll uh, give people some time to file in. All right. Hello, and thanks to everyone for joining us today for Money Matters, with the Authors Guild Foundation. Today, we're discussing planning for retirement as an author and freelancer. Our host for the series, Aaron Lowry, is back today. Aaron's a financial translator and the author of the three-part Broke Millennial series of books. She's been featured widely across media. I'm glad to have her back. Uh, today, she's leading a discussion with three certified financial planners. Uh, thanks to everybody who submitted a question in advance. And uh, we have a Q&A box. Uh, there's a button below that you can use to type in a question, and we'll try to answer as many as we can after the talk. And also, we have closed captions available if you'd like. And with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron Lowry. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, Johnny. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited about today's discussion, and we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to jump right in with some introductions. First, we'll start with Douglas Bonaparte, who is the president and founder of Bonafide Wealth, a New York City-based wealth management firm. He sits on the CNBC Financial Advisor Council and has been named one of the most influential financial advisors in the country by Investopedia for the past four years. Ana Anjay Conte is an MBA and a CFP and a proud Puerto Rican and Gambian American entrepreneur who is committed to showing women of color what is possible. Ana spent eight years working in wealth management, advising ultra high net worth families, which for our reference means 5 million plus net worth on how to grow and secure their wealth for generations to come. She left corporate America in the hopes of giving women like herself Black women, Latinas, and daughter of immigrants, the blueprint to leverage their businesses and build family changing wealth. And we have Ben Henry Moreland, who is the founder of Freelance Financial Planning and is also a senior financial planning nerd for Kitesis.com. He is a former professional musician who now specializes in helping self-employed people achieve financial security. So quite the esteemed lineup today. I'm so excited to dig in. So first is a question for the whole panel. Uh, we'll start with your response. What do you see is the most common misconception people have about preparing for a stable retirement? Yeah, I think people have this idea that they have to be very linear in their savings and their uh, understanding of what their retirement is going to look like. And just like our life pre-retirement has a lot of ups and downs. Our life after retirement is going to shift and change, right? And so we really need to plan for those various phases, both pre and after retirement. Doug, what about you? I love that answer, um, that it's not linear. I think that, yeah, I, I, I'm going to double down on that. I think a lot of times in planning, I find that people are just looking at a situation where they're done working, like that's it. And that's almost like homage to like my grandparents down in Boca Raton playing golf every day and going to the diner. I, I did that with them. It was awesome. Don't get me wrong. But um, I don't think that's going to be us. And I think we have to think a little bit more dynamic in terms of finding things that you know, we love to do that might also make money. Look, it could be not working forever, but um, a lot of scenarios look like, hey, if I work 15, 20 hours a week, make a fraction of what I did at the peak of my career at some point in my career, you know, I get to stay occupied doing something I like and also fund my own retirement. So in that case, it's not retirement, it's financial independence to have the ability to choose what you want to do with your time. And sometimes you continue spending time doing the thing you like to do that makes money. So that's what I love about uh, what was said there and it not being linear. It's certainly dynamic. Ben? Sure. I mean, I would say the biggest misconception I see and hear from clients often is that there is a place that they should be like right now for their age or for their position in life. And it's, it's the reason that's similar to the answer that, that my two colleagues just gave here is that um, everyone is a different scenario. Everyone has different values. Everyone has different goals. And uh, the number for someone who is, you know, 35 years old or 40 years old or 60 years old, uh, it's just not going to be the same for everyone. So when you ask, where should I be for retirement right now? That answer is always really just going to depend on what kind of a life you actually want to live, um, both pre and after retirement. And uh, just, what you, you know, what your goals are really for, for the future. I do want to say on that, I know we all love a benchmark, but the answer to everything is it depends. 
which will be a, a prevalent topic, I am sure, throughout today's conversation. But we're going to give you information on how to figure out that it depends for yourself. Now, uh, Douglas, you can you give us an overview on different retirement savings vehicles that we should know about? You know, we hear about like 401ks, IRAs, defined benefit plans, 403Bs. There's all of these terms. Yeah. What should we know? Yeah. So a little bit of study will show you where and, and why each of these retirement plans may apply to you in your particular situation. And I think, you know, the ones that are commonly thrown around the most are what's offered through uh, an employer. And that might not be so applicable here, right? So the 401k plans or 403b plans, higher contribution limits, you can get $19,500 in those plans. But if you are a freelancer and running your own business, you might not be able to access that plan. On the contrary, there are individual 401ks that you can set up for yourself. There are what are called SEP IRAs. So a self-employed person can set up an IRA and get those higher contribution limits as opposed to what generally everyone has access to, which are the IRAs, which have lower contribution limits, $6,000 for individuals uh, 50 years of age or less. So um, there's a lot of options available to you, depending on how much money you're making and, and what your net income is. Well, how much did you make after all of your expenses will show you ultimately what you can put into these plans. And the one reason to do that, of course, is to save for financial independence and retirement. But the tax benefits that come along with making these contributions are typically what make them so appealing for investors to put money into them. And you can do that on a number of bases or two different ways on a pre-tax basis and on an after-tax basis. And that would get us into whether or not you want to be making Roth contributions or these pre-tax contributions. And I'll stop right there because we'll go down a rabbit hole. But these are the types of plans that are out there. Again, from very simple, straightforward stuff like individual retirement accounts to um, you know something that replicates what employers would provide you uh, if you worked for an employer, the 401ks and the SEP IRA. So that's, that's I think, where I would keep it in, in a nutshell, so to speak. Well, and to dig in on that just a little bit, you know, we've got some folks in here who are full-time authors, and that's the only job that we do, but I bet most of us have multiple jobs, and some of whom are full-time employees who might also have an employer-sponsored plan. So, Anna, is it possible for you to have a full-time job outside of your writing income, utilize that 401k, and set up another account for your writing income or any other income that you might have as a self-employed person or a freelancer? Absolutely. It's it's a, a way that you can really maximize those years when you do have a higher income outside of your traditional employment, right? So we're talking to a group of authors, you sign, uh, you know, you release a book in this current year, you have a lot of income. And so therefore you, you might be able to sock away a little bit of money, uh, a little bit of extra money, right? So I think you know, it's very unsatisfactory, but I'm going to say it depends on your own situation, right? That's that's going to be a common thread here. But, um, you know, for example, someone might work a W-2 job, right? Have a traditional 401k plan, be able to contribute up to that 19500 that that Douglas mentioned, but then also have a traditional IRA on the side, a Roth IRA on the side, a SEP on the side for that self-employed income, and can really target, um, you know, those extra plans that, to allow them to either catch up or really just maximize their income in that year and or maximize the tax benefits and sort of soften the tax bill they might have in a particular high income year. I know it can be a little bit overwhelming to try to figure out which IRA is the best option for you if you're gonna go that route, which I would plug, talk to a CPA and have somebody look at your whole tax plan. Uh, but we did have a question come in specifically for SEP IRAs, are they silly or smart for single member LLC? So I'm curious to pose this to the group, anybody who wants to take it, feel free. But I mean, I'll just speak for myself, I'm a single member LLC and I have one. So maybe this was a mistake, but that's what was the right move for <laughs> no, me at the time. I don't, I don't think it was a mistake. I, I think that, you know, when you're a single member, or it's just you, you know, a solo, a solo entrepreneur, and you're looking at a step, it's a really good option there. You don't necessarily, because here's what happens. As soon as you bring on employees and if you choose to scale your business, right? This is where you now need to do the very same thing you're doing for yourself, for your employees of the business. So when you're, when you're using a SEP, that can get expensive depending on what percentage of your net income or what you're paying yourself 
uh, is being put into the plan, right? 20% on someone you're paying $50,000. That's 10 grand you got to pony up. It's a really nice thing, by the way, nice incentive for them to stick around and feel appreciated. But is, is that something you can afford to do is I think the bigger question. And that's when you might say, hey, are there other types of designs that would be um, just as beneficial for my employees um, as it would be for me. Um, but again, getting outside of there. So I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I, I think it's actually a very appropriate thing that you could have, if, whether it's a single member LLC or, or it's just you, like uh, you didn't even create an entity and you're just doing what's called the schedule C. Um, so no, no regrets there, Aaron, you're, you're, you're doing it. Go for it. Now, I will, oh, go ahead, Ben. Oh, sorry. I just, I wanted to, to hop onto that answer and, and mention that, um, that SEPs are, are, can be a really good idea um, for you know, people who are self-employed, um, but oftentimes, um, and Doug, Douglas mentions um, the solo 401k, the individual 401k, um, and I think that can actually be a, a much more flexible option for people who are self-employed um, and, and LLCs because there is a higher contribution limit um, because there is sort of an employee and an employer version of the contribution. And actually the employee version is not tied to how much actual income that you make. So if you have a SEP, if you have you know, $50,000 of income, you have a limited amount that you can actually put in there. You're limited to, to basically 20% of your uh, self-employed income. So if you have $50,000 of income, you can put $10,000 in a SEP. Uh, if you had a solo 401k, you could put in $19,500, that entire 401k contribution, plus another 10% if you actually have that you know, money to fund it. So um, really, I think it, it like there's nothing wrong with, with a SEP, but solo 401ks also give you a lot more flexibility. There is also the ability to, to save uh, to Roth versus all sort of pre-tax money too. So um, certainly nothing wrong with the, with the SEP and those do have their advantages, but Solo 401ks also offer a lot of the things that the SEP already does, but also a lot more different options uh, for some more flexibility and, and ability to contribute a, a higher percentage. I'll quickly add two things to that because I like everything Ben just said there. Those are all strong arguments for a 401k over a SEP IRA. Two things. Um, one, a 401k is, an, is considered that employer-sponsored plan. It's covered by ERISA, so federal laws that protect you greater than uh, the rules around IRA. So if you're concerned about those types of things, liability, things in your life, 401k is stronger there. And two, setting them up, um, very straightforward. You know, I, I would argue I've seen single 401k is just as easy as set up, if not easier than steps. So um, at the single K level, um, very straightforward stuff. However, getting outside of just one, uh, just yourself, you got to scrap the single K and go for an actual 401k plan or revert back to a SEP. So you have to think about the future of your business, right? And whether or not, and how that growth um, may impact the plan that you're using, um, not just as a way to shelter income for taxation purposes, but for incentivizing employees. So now we're getting into larger business planning conversations by just having a simple conversation around 401ks and staff. Ugh. It's all very true. And then coming back to the just whole conversation about prioritizing and setting aside money for retirement. So many of us earn variable income. It's unpredictable. It's stressful at times, particularly in a pandemic. So what are some best practices for how you can set aside money for retirement on an unpredictable or variable income? Well, that's really kind of the million dollar question, isn't it, uh, for, for retirement planning is, is how do you prioritize um, putting that money aside? Because like you said, there's a lot of anxiety wrapped up in having a, a variable income, having an unpredictable income. How do you prioritize planning for the future when uh, you're not 100% certain of, of, you know, having the money to make rents uh, next month or, or in two months. Um, and so part of it, really the place to start is just having some, some idea of when you do have enough for your immediate expenses, because those are always really the priority. You, you have, um, you know, you, you've got rent to pay, you've got to buy groceries for yourself. Um, and so, but, but when it gets to the point where you're so anxious about, about, you know, meeting those expenses and you don't have some awareness of what your actual needs are, um, 
then the tendency is just to keep saving and saving and saving money, sort of stashing it away, sort of squirreling it away in your bank accounts um, without having any prioritization for sort of the long term. Um, so I think the place to really start with, with um, you know, being able to prioritize retirement savings um, with uncertain income is to have some awareness of, first of all, what kind of what your expenses are, what your real needs are. Um, being able to sit down and say, okay, I just got paid today. What, how, could, how do I need to stretch this until the next time I get paid? How many months rent do I need to pay? Um, and so forth. So you have an idea of what your, I guess, first kind of bucket is of expenses that you need to fill up. Um, and once that sort of bucket is filled, uh, then you're able to kind of prioritize your retirement savings um, on top of that. So just having confidence in the fact that you have enough setting a place where, where you're like, all right, my immediate needs are covered. Now I can go on to, to prioritize. And there are, there are strategies, I think, for once you sort of, um, once you reach that place where you're comfortable enough um, to, to start prioritizing. So that first step is really just being in the right mental space, I would say, to be able to, to prioritize the future because you feel comfortable enough to, to meet your expenses today. Once you reach that place, um, I think a couple good strategies to, to make sure you are funding retirement. Uh, first of all is, I think, segregating, setting aside the money that you, um, that you need to save towards certain goals, um, whether that is money that you're going to put to your retirement account, money that you need to save for taxes, I think is, is an essential one, and also money that you need to save for kind of emergency expenses. Um, you can either do this by having like four different bank accounts. This one is going to be where my retirement savings goes, and I'm going to put that you know, I'm going to put that in my retirement account when I file taxes next year. And you've got one bank account there for your estimated tax payments and one that's just your emergency fund that you're going to tap into only if you, you know, have some unexpected expenses. And then you've just got your regular checking account that you use for, for normal expenses. Uh, you can do that physical sort of separation, or you can sort of, you can make it more of an accounting difference. And there are, are good apps to use for this. I really like uh, You Need a Budget or YNAB for this. Um, it really makes it really good to um, sort of mentally segregate the funds that are available for your more immediate needs versus what you're saving for the future. Um, on top of that, I think like it's always really good to, to automate as much as you can. Um, understanding that that's not always possible in some cases, if you're not um, earning a, a real consistent income, you know, maybe you can, can put $500 a month into your IRA, um, or maybe you just need to sort of set that aside in a bank account and say, I'm going to put this in at the end of the year. Um, and, and uh, but it's still there sort of available because, really once you put money into a retirement account, an IRA, um, it's really hard to take it out. So you really need to sort of prioritize that, that sort of liquidity. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I think it's also good to keep in mind that you don't necessarily need a retirement account. Um, those accounts do have, have tax advantage that makes them, them like good savings vehicles, but also there are different types of accounts. There are after-tax accounts, like just a regular brokerage account. You can invest in the same sort of stocks and bonds in there. You, they might add a little bit to your year-to-year -year tax bill, but at the same time, they're more flexible if you ever need to sort of take that money out. Now, it's, it's uh, uh, having that ability to do it might create the temptation to actually draw funds out of it. Um, but at the same time, like if you're really worried about having that flexibility sort of year to year um, and not being able to draw money out of your retirement account, there are options outside of just the, the traditional sort of, um, I guess, traditional and Roth IRAs um, on top of that. So it's a, it's a difficult question because again, everyone's, everyone's sort of situation is different and the income uh, situation that they deal with. But once you kind of have if you prioritize having the cash that you need on hand available for your really immediate needs, um, it can really be a, a sort of mental shift of, okay, I have enough here. And I can really start thinking about what my retirement situation looks like. And um, you can start to prioritize how, 
how you're going to divide up each paycheck after that, once you've met your, your immediate needs, um, you can start to prioritize how to divide those paychecks to, to actually start putting money away for the future. Now, when we think about the future, obviously one of the most common questions people are asking about retirement is how much is enough? Now, it depends, aside being the answer. I'm curious what you would recommend people take into account when figuring out the answer to that question for themselves. So Anna, why don't we start with you? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I think so much of this conversation comes comes back to awareness, right? Like Ben was just talking about really having clarity and awareness as to what your expenses are, what your cash flow needs are, and also what, you know, the potential needs you would have in the future are is the first step, right? I can't tell you how much you need to have saved for retirement if you have no idea how much you spent, right? And this is not no judgment whatsoever, but we need to have inputs in order to give you an output and be able to tell you, right? So, so that's the first thing. I'd say, secondly, you know, we have to look like I started off talking about how retirement planning is not linear, right? You have to look at where, what you have in retirement, what you're going to be spending, and then also sort of what you anticipate your earnings are going to be over the next one, two, three, four years, right? We're talking to a group of authors here. You're going to have really lumpy income, extremely high income years, lower income years. And that's, that's completely normal, but you have to have a plan in place in order to be able to prioritize those retirement contributions and ensuring your future financial safety um, and security and, you know, the option to live life on your own terms as, as Douglas was talking about earlier. Um, it's, it's very, I will say one thing, you know, just to kind of piggyback off what Ben was talking about as well. Um, you know, it's very tempting to continue to push things off, right? Like I'll get to it when I get to the point where I have more money or my book sells more, or I get more contracts, you know, I will, I will, I'll put it away. But, but the challenge is, is that a lot of times that day doesn't come unless you have a really large contract or a very large advance or something that comes in. And so I would challenge people to really make sure that they are, even if it's a small amount, putting something towards it, um, instead of just pushing it off for the future, because the future quickly becomes never uh, or, or 20 years down the road if we're not careful. Douglas or Ben, any additional thoughts or considerations that people need to take into account when figuring out how much is enough in retirement? I think um, having a real, so when I, when I work with mostly young professionals and they're trying to think 20, 30 plus years down the road, let's be honest, it's very hard to do, right? It's very hard to understand where you're going to be, what you're going to do, what things cost, what you need economically in order to live, again, it gets even harder, the subjective notion of a comfortable lifestyle for yourself. Like not only is that, you know, hard to wrap your head around, but going that far down in time is also hard to wrap your head around. So to help with that, we try and want to get what we try and do is get control or an understanding of how we're living today. Use what you know now to help you augment or change or think about what might be in the future. Go with the facts. Identify. So get in control. Identify what your current lifestyle is. You'd be shocked. You know, maybe everyone here on this panel wouldn't be shocked, but you're shocked. How many people have no idea, no idea um, what that monthly figure is that makes them, and this is subjective, comfortable, you know, what works for them. And as planners, what we try and do is help people get to the cross section of comfort and maximizing their savings, right? So that push and pull is probably the hardest thing in all of personal finance, because it always comes back to behavior and what you do. And we're all human beings who like to, you know, get emotional around stuff, especially money. So th this is really kind of the, the, you know, the, the thing we want to really drill down on you know, at the fundamental level that we see again, show up at the retirement planning level. So again, figure out where you are now, because then you can say, all right, I get to do everything I want to do. This is fairly comfortable. It costs me $4,000 a month. I can pay rent, do all the things I want to do, get the savings in that I need. Well, if I'm working this hard for the next 25 years to live this lifestyle, I've done something horribly wrong. I'm supposed to be balling out on double this, right? Or what would 50% more be? Or maybe I'm burning cash more today to support my business and what I'm doing and have all the stuff, fun I want to do. I can imagine slowing down, you know, later on. For a lot of young families, it's you know, 80% of their money is going to. I could speak for myself here. It all goes to the kids. I dream, dream in a world where all the money I'm spending on my children comes back to my wife and myself to go enjoy. 
I mean, oh my God, that sounds like a dream come true. I don't even need to increase, you know, what it is we're bringing in. I just need, I just need to be able to use that money for once. That would be super sweet. So again, it, it's giving that context by using what you know today to then think intelligently about something that's very, you know, that's hard, far down the, far down the road, decades even. In, a, in an environment, who knows, you know, maybe we'll be in the metaverse. I don't know. But um, nonetheless, let's use what we have today. I think that's my best advice. I guess my, my the only thing, those are both, both really, really great answers. Uh, the only thing I really have to add to it is that when you're focused on having a number that is like, this is my sort of, this is my enough number for number of retirement savings. Um, it doesn't really also take into account the fact that time is also one of your resources. Um, and that if you're so focused on getting to a, a point where there's, there's sort of enough money, um, you may not find yourself having the actual time uh, to, to enjoy it, um, whether that is you're working so hard to get to this number by a certain date uh, that you're just, you know, just working all the time, just focus on, on you know, more and more, more all the time until there's finally enough, uh, or you've worked so long that all of a sudden you just, you don't have the time left uh, literally in your life to enjoy it. And so uh, I think that, that when you're thinking about what what is sort of enough, it should not only be, you know, take into account the sort of lifestyle that you want to live, but also like how long you want to be able to enjoy it. Because, you know, honestly, when, when someone gets to retirement age, gets to their, their you know, maybe their 60s, um, there is a limited amount of time left to enjoy it. The longer you keep going, the less that, you know, the more that time shrinks and, and you know, everyone's got a, a different life expectancy, but um, but you know, you're running the risk of, of not being able to enjoy that time. So I think when you're, when you're thinking of like, what is enough here, um, you know, there might be some room for flexibility in terms of the, the numbers and the dates. Uh, but you should also be, be aware that, you know, maybe there can be a little bit of flexibility in lifestyle, uh, but that's a trade-off to the amount of time that you're, you're actually going to be able to spend doing it. Yeah, that's a great point. And thinking about planning for all of that, and you know, we all love tools and resources and calculators now. I know the three of you probably have some fancy ones that we don't necessarily have access to. So do you have recommendations for online resources, any that might be specific to freelancers that I'm not even aware of, but do you have favorite calculators, websites, resources that people can go to to play around with some real numbers and research their own retirement plan? Anna, let's start with you. Sure. Um, we have all the fancy tools, but sometimes things can get muddied that way, right? Uh, I Vanguard has a great calculator. Most online brokerages that you'll find have good calculators for, you know, how much you're going to need on uh, in retirement, right? So Vanguard is very simple. Put in your age, how much you make, how much, when you want to retire, what year, and how much in assets you already have. And then it just spits out, like, this is how much you need to save every year, right? And that's a good way you can kind of play with it. Um, it has a... a what are those things called a little icon you can drag and, and sort of adjust what you're saving so that you can see what what that means in terms of your overall sort of retirement security any other favorite tools ben yeah i mean so i don't know any that are specifically like focused for for freelancers unfortunately part of that is kind of the nature of these kind of retirement calculators if you're looking out over a long-term time horizon um, the variability of income tends not to, like, it, it matters a lot to you in the short term, but it tends not to, to matter as much in the long term if there is a relatively sort of smooth arc, uh, if you will. Um, you know, hopefully your income is, is generally rising over time. Um, and that's kind of what, what those, those calculators tend to assume. If you think of it in the way that, that, um, you know, stocks and bonds go up. They're not going to. They're not going to return the same amount every year. But when you look at one of those sliders, it says, "Hey, let's say you're earning an average five percent return every year." 
you're not going to earn a 5% return maybe in any of those years, but that's going to be the average over time. Uh, it's the same thing when you think of, of your income. So when you're actually putting in the numbers to use that thing, you're not necessarily going to want to use the number that's on your tax return from last year of being like, oh, this is going to be my average income over time. You might need to do a little bit of, of um, math, unfortunately, to, or, or just, just looking to put the numbers in context a little bit of maybe what you can expect over an average rather than like this is the amount that I, I you know, made last year or making this year. Um, so, but, but like Anna said, like I think really most, um, most kind of online brokerages, uh, we lost Erin, um, hopefully she'll come back, but most online types of brokerages, um, <laughs> if you have your retirement account set up somewhere out, right, especially a major one like a Vanguard or Fidelity, um, I know they, they have one too. Uh, they provide a lot of those, those calculators and a lot of them kind of serve the same functions, but it's, they're nice in terms of being able to, to sort of look at different scenarios, I guess, and see what the impact of, of maybe a little bit different um, adjustment in, in income or assumptions for what your income is, what is the assumption for what inflation is going to be over the long term for investment returns. They let you move those, those things around. But the important thing is like, to really just know what you're what you're looking at, at. and it's a projection. Um, it is definitely not a crystal ball into the future. Um, I think those things are interesting when you, if you find like one time during the year to go in and do this this little retirement calculation, and then maybe you go back next year and you do it again and see what the change is. Um, sometimes that seeing the difference between the two can actually tell you a little bit more than. The actual number that comes out of it, just because you get a sense of what direction that you're going in, and is your situation improving or not? Um, I love that. I love that suggestion, Ben. Um, I I was talking to someone who told me that every January she like logs in to her Social Security and downloads her Social Security report, and, and then she also like reviews her finances and sort of sets her financial goals for the year. And I think that's a really great way to like have a multi-year sort of sense of how things are going and really to keep up because like I said earlier, time can get away from you if you're not careful. Um, the other thing I will say is this is a really good plug for our profession, right? Like really a lot of this stuff is really hard. And it's hard to say like, okay, I, I'm making this much now and I, I might make this much next year and maybe that much the year after and how much should I be putting away and is it enough? And if I want to quit my job, like, you know, what happens then? I think it's, it's really important to have at some points, especially with these complexities, someone that you can talk to, financial coach, advisor, whatever, financial planner that can help you sort of um, navigate the, that multi-year variance without too much stress or sleepless. Welcome back, Erin. Sorry, guys. Ain't it always something? So is that just the high net worth individuals question? No, we, we, we stalled a little bit so you could get to that. I, I was, I was going to be so bold to be like, well, why don't, you know, it's smart of Erin to provide us with the uh, you know, roadmap of the conversation here. But uh, you're, back, you're back just in time for that. Outside of the fancy planning tools, have we sufficiently wrapped that up? Is that good? Okay, we're there. So, Anna, as I mentioned in the intro, you have spent part of your career working with ultra high net worth individuals. We're defining that as five million plus net worths, which we always love to know what the wealthy are doing. That's got to be one of the most clickbait questions when you look at a headline at a financial outlet. So I'm curious, even though that number sounds insanely out of reach to a lot of us, what are some key lessons that we can take away that anyone can apply that those folks are doing maybe a little differently when it comes to retirement planning or general financial wellness? Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest lessons for me, you know, I grew up very middle class, right, but not necessarily with a long term multi year perspective of my financial life. And I think that's really the biggest lesson that I learned in working at wealth management, right? How to sit down now. Now it's not a, it's, it's an art, it's not a science and, and nobody expects you to have sort of the exact 
like minutia down for 30 years of your life, but really being able to say like, what is, what do I want to happen and really have a plan, even if you're not there right now to be able to make those shifts and sort of a multi-year plan and, and just continue to revisit it and tweak it and adjust it as needed. Um, the other I think is just, they're always prioritizing their financial health, right? Like I find that even people that were not, you know, multi-generational wealthy that just were, you know, high earners and high savers throughout their career, they were always non-negotiable about saving for the future. And, um, you know, that's not the kind of environment I grew up in. And so I, I really recognize that that's not always possible for people. And I, and I understand that on a, on a deep level, but at the same time, I think we have to push ourselves to, on some level, prioritize that longer term financial health, just to make sure that we're able to, you know, retire comfortably, and then, you know, hopefully to do better for future generations as well. Now, Ben, for those who are approaching retirement age, so perhaps folks that are logged in that are already in their 50s or 60s and thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm ready to move on to this next step. What are some strategies they should put in place to feel more stable on a variable income, whether that's from book sales, other unpredictable incomes, or possibly trying to live off of their investments? Sure. Um, so a lot of the principles are sort of the same, right? Where um, having enough liquidity, having the ability to you know, pay for your expenses when uh, when they actually arise uh, are as important when you're, you're you know, near or approaching retirement as they were when we were younger. Um, I think the, the biggest difference of uh, when you're, you're starting to near retirement is that some of the risks of making mistakes uh, actually start to, start to increase. Um, if, you're, if you're younger, um, let's say you, you put some money in a retirement account and you've invested it and the markets crash and you decide, I, I don't want that. And so you pull money out of it. Um, it you know, maybe it's a mistake, um, but you have a lot of time to sort of recover from that. Um, and when you're getting close to retirement, you don't have that time. Um, and so some of the risks of, of not having the liquidity that you need on hand uh, start, to, start to increase because if you do, you know, start to get to the point where you're living off of your savings and um, you need to take money out of your, your account and the stock market takes a dive, that's really going to cost you um, in the long run because, because when you take that money out, um, it really it doesn't have the opportunity to grow and recover uh, sort of in the future. For, so in terms of kind of concrete strategies, um, again, a lot of it comes down to understanding what you actually need, what your... Um, uh, what your uh, expenses kind of look like, having some awareness of that. And really, I think, a, a, you know, one strategy would be really setting an amount of, of cash that says, when I have this amount of cash in my accounts, um, I'm doing well. If it drops below this amount, then I need to refill it. Um, you're, and you're getting to the point, you know, once you sort of retire where you're not worried so much anymore about saving for the future. You're just worried about stretching your existing savings out uh, for a lifetime. So it's really much more focused on um, on what you're spending rather than what you what you need to save for the future. Um, the other side of it is just kind of risk management. If you do have investments that you're living off of um, and you haven't kept tabs on them in a while, maybe you're just in a like straightforward kind of S&P 500 stock funds um, and or just maybe in a bunch of individual stocks that you've invested in over the long term. Um, now is a time to really take a look at that. If you're going to start to need to um, take withdrawals from that in the near future, um, there are some strategies to, to take some of the risk of the ups and downs in the stock market out of that portfolio, whether it's it's adding more investments in bonds. And sometimes you don't even need to necessarily know a lot about like stocks and bonds to be able to do that. Could just be investing in like a retirement date fund that automatically kind of brings down the risk of your overall portfolio uh, to make it so that there's less risk of loss in a, in a stock market. That'll make it a little more, um, maybe give you a little bit more certainty or you know, using uh, someone to, to actually manage your investments. Well, that can be a human investment advisor 
or it can be like a, a betterment or some some um, you know online sort of company that that does it more automatically for you. Um, but just having having some awareness of what your actual I guess kind of tolerance for risk is um, in terms of like, am I going to be 100% reliant on my investment savings? Um, what other resources do I have? Am I going to have a, you know, when am I going to start taking social, social security? How much of my expenses is that going to actually cover? Um, and how much, you know, on top of that, if you're, if you've got book royalties in the future or book sales or, you know, any sort of income, is that just going to be on top of the rest of your income? And you can, you know, use that, you, you, you know, finish a book and, and, you know, take the, uh, take the proceeds and you can use that for vacation and, and traveling and stuff when you're in retirement, or are you actually going to need to that to sort of supplement your savings? So just having some awareness of what your, um, you know, what your needs are, what your, your sort of expenses are going to look like, and then kind of, I guess, inventorying your, um, your resources for the ability to actually meet that um, are going to be the big steps there. Well, we're at the last about 20 minutes. So I do want to get into some of the questions that our listeners have been putting in. And one that has come in and one that also was submitted several times earlier is this idea of a lot of the conversation is around preparing for the future. But what if you are already in your 50s or 60s and you haven't been laying much groundwork? There's this question of, is it too late to start? So what are the next steps? if you're already in your 50s or 60s and just now starting to think about retirement. Uh, Douglas, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. So um, the first thing I, I would do here is, is tell any individual who thinks it's too late to get started that it's never, never, never too late. So um, having the right attitude here and having the right approach is, is really everything because once you go down that hole, you may never dig your way out. Um, the second thing is take it very seriously then, right? So that would be probably the greatest call to action that you could have to get all your ducks in a row and get organized and get empowered about what you can do to fix your situation. Look, this doesn't mean there's an easy road for you, but it also means there is a road for you. And you might have to get a little uncomfortable. It could be a reduction in, in the comfort that we talked about earlier to maximize savings. It could be pushing out how long it is you need to work or having a lowered expectation of the kind of lifestyle you're going to live during retirement. I think it requires you to be open and honest with yourself as to what is possible given some inherent constraints that you've set up here. But does that mean you can't do anything and you should bury your head in the sand? No way. That will guarantee you that you do not find yourself in a position to achieve financial independence. So let's take that whole notion that you can't catch up or can't do anything about it and just throw it out the window and then take ownership over your situation and get to work either hiring a financial advisor, doing your own due diligence and figuring out what uh, is going on in your financial life and equipping yourself with knowledge. Not easy. It's easy for us to say this. Going through the motions and certainly getting rid of that mentality in of itself is a difficult thing. And then taking action can be a difficult thing, but nothing worth doing is easy. And if you thought, you know, this, this was easy, then everyone would be financially independent and retired. No problem. We'd be out of jobs. Um, so, you know, one hand, thank, thank goodness that's not happening here, but it's kind of one of those things where, yeah, I wish people, you know, would put me out of a job in some ways, because that would mean we got a pretty awesome society when it comes to handling money and finance. So let's get rid of that mentality. Anna, would you add anything? Um, that was spectacular. And I agree wholeheartedly. You saw my little standing ovation, Douglas. However, uh, I will say um, the one thing I would say is like, you know, we have as human beings this tendency to be all or nothing, right? Like, oh, and, and, and to fall into despair when we feel like we're behind, right? Whatever that means. And I just always tell people like, would you rather have something or nothing, right? And so, you know, it's better to at least get on the path and then manage your expectations or, you know, deal with some discomfort either now or later, as Douglas said. But, but really, I'd say, you know, any amount of time is too, is never too late. Even if you have a year or five or six years to retirement, at the very least, if you're intentional and focused, then you know you you'll be grateful that you took that time and and made those hard choices. I do also want to jump on one point that was raised: this idea of hiring a financial planner to help. And I think sometimes there's this very common misconception that you need to be wealthy in order to have a financial planner. You know, I know Ben, yours is called freelance finance. So it, it's pretty much in there that, 
this is for anyone. So I would love to hear from you about what it means to hire somebody, even if it's just so you find someone to do a little tune-up, gut check your retirement plan before you move on. Is that an option for folks? Yeah, so Aaron, you're right that um, a lot of the traditional conception of, of financial planners is you can only hire someone if you have you know a million dollars or something and, and a bunch of investments to kind of plunk down with them and that there's really this, this focus on just investing. Um, and that's really not true anymore. There are still a lot of, of planners who do that, but um, if you look around, there are, are so many different financial planners who, who provide different services for different types of people. I sp specifically focus on freelancers, and I know that, that many people just don't have you know, a lot of assets to be able to throw at um, a, a financial planner. And so I, the way I charge is, is either, you know, I do, you know, just do a one, a one-time plan where if someone does just need a, a one-time check-in uh, or maybe to come, you know, check in this year and maybe come back next year or come back in a couple of years to sort of refresh, you know, we can do it that way. I also do sort of a subscription model. I'm not saying this to, to like plug my business, though I obviously am, but also um, it's, it's also just shows that there are a lot of people who, who do different things. And, and there are, different advisors now who also reach very, very, and, and specialize in very, very specific niches of individuals. So it's, it's really worth taking the time to try and find someone who, um, who serves, I think, people like you and, and specializes in, in situations like, like your own, because like everyone is different, but also even if you think your situation is very unique, um, if you search around and, and I think, uh, like there are, are places like XY Planning Network where you can actually physically go in and, and search for, you know, based on, on a lot of specific criteria. But if you go and search for someone based on your own specific um, situation, chances are pretty decent that you're actually going to find someone who, who uh, can, can work well in your situation. And I just want to say that again, it's XY Planning Network is one of the search tools you can do. I know the CFP board has one, I believe it's called Let's Make a Plan, which is a search tool you can use. And these can also be specified to like your very, very niche things and that you might be interested in. Could be your own background, could be where you are in your life. It could be a big event you're going through, whether that's marriage, divorce, buying a house. Like there's so many factors to consider. So I just want to put that out there for everyone. Now, someone did just ask, is it possible to construct a retirement plan through only Fidelity or Vanguard or a similar brokerage? I do want to just throw out there, we are not giving you specific investing advice. You're saying specific brokerages you should use. Just a big disclaimer that I feel like these folks were going to say anyway, but Fidelity and Vanguard being names of well-known brokerages. So Douglas, let's kick off with you. Is, is that a perfectly fine way to be building your retirement plan if you're doing a DIY approach? Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. One, one thing that in, in my practice that I recognized early on is that um, people like the option to do things any number of ways, the things uh, that, you know, uh, suit them. And, and therefore, we, we've taken, and it may have been said earlier, an approach of where we'll just lead with financial planning and then figure out anything else that the client wants to do. So you're specifically talking about, is it okay if I do the investment management piece on my own, either at a Fidelity or a Vanguard or Schwab? or hire a robo-advisor, a Betterment, or a Wealthfront. Yeah, these are all viable tools to help you get disciplined when it comes to investing and stay invested. You got to find the way that works for you. I have clients that love paying a financial planning fee for advice and getting their you know, financial roadmap written down on a piece of paper, and they're good with managing millions of dollars on their own or investing in real estate. That's something they got to take care of themselves. There's only so much you know, farming out you can do there. Happy to work with people like that, as well as folks who just, most of my clients, they just don't want to deal with it. They're chasing kids around. They're working 60 to 80 hours a week. They don't, they don't want to click rebalance. They don't want to do trades on Fidelity or Vanguard. So naturally, there's value to them to go hire a professional to do that or outsource it to a uh, robo-advisor. So I'm pretty agnostic here. And I would definitely say, uh, if you're you know interested in doing it, have the time to do it and get disciplined around doing it. Um, yeah, go for it. You can actually save yourself. So I'm selling away from myself. You can, you can, you can save yourself a buck or two by, by taking control of these things on your own. Clearly adding it as a service for people who don't want to do it is an opportunity for us and a way to help people become very uh, disciplined with it. But yeah, I'm not going to knock anyone who wants to do this on their own and take control. I admire that. 
I just know a lot of times, uh, at least in my practice, uh, time runs thin, people get very busy, and that's when mistakes get made. So just be on the lookout for when maybe your responsibilities go up because you're becoming more and more successful in your business and your writing. And if you're seeing your free time go down as a function of how uh, busy you've become, then just be mindful and careful that you're not making any mistakes. Like, oh, I was supposed to every month log into my account and place those trades. And now the market has gone up and I feel bad about that. So it really comes down to what works for you. These are all acceptable options. Geez, you can invest for free these days. So you know, there, there's as, uh, as an objective take as I could possibly have, um, given I'm someone who actually makes money investing people's money. So enjoy that for the time being. Well, I'm kind of piggybacking on that idea of, you know, you can do it for free. And this ties into a little bit of minimums that might be needed in certain accounts to get started. Anna, we had the question, how little is too little to even start saving for retirement? What if you only have, say, $1,000 to set aside in order to get started? Is that enough to get started? Literally, it is enough. Like, you got 50 bucks, it's enough, right? And I, and I think I, I preach nonstop about the importance of starting small and not really feeling as though you have to hit this huge amount. I have to be able to put away $20,000 this year. I have to be able to put away, you know, $30,000 in order to make this worth it. Starting with that is, is very important. One, because it brings, um, it, it builds that discipline that, that Doug was talking about. It also builds the practice of investing. And once you get into that habit, it's, it's, it's kind of addictive, right? Like the money is working, right? And it's doing things. Um, so I would say absolutely, you know, we, we mentioned Fidelity or Vanguard. I'm not giving specific investment advice. However, those are places where you can have very low minimums, right? You can start with $100 and buy mutual funds or buy ETFs and, you know, gain access to the market with whatever free cash you have. Yeah, I love that. Now, a question too that we got that I want everyone to answer is, do you feel that there's one provision for someone's retirement that you see people consistently failing to anticipate? So Ben, let's start with you. One mistake that, or provision that people always forget about, that classic thing. The classic thing. Um, I guess that I can, I can name two that I, I guess I'll just do one because the other, because someone else will probably answer the other one. Uh, the first one I'm, I'm going to talk about though is, is um, fees really. Um, the amount that you pay for, if you're putting money in a retirement account, um, the amount that you, that you pay for other people to manage your money. Maybe that is, that is at a, a human financial advisor who's charging 1% of um, the, the, you know, assets that you have. Maybe it's you buy a mutual fund. Um, this, people don't do this so much any, any nowadays, but I still see it where people buy a mutual fund um, and they pay 5% of the price of that mutual fund uh, off the top. Or um, you're putting money at a, um, you know, at a Fidelity or a Schwab or something like that. But you're buying some, some fund that, um, you know, looks like it's a, it's a, a sort of great fund. Maybe it's got had nice returns over the last couple of years, but when you look into the buy and print of the fund, it's charging maybe close to 1% of your, your assets over time. And when you look at over the time periods of um, uh, in a, in a retirement investment horizon, if you're 30 years from retirement, even if you're like 10 years from retirement, um, but you still have you know 30 years to sort of plan for, the amount that that actually adds up that 1% or so adds up to over time really eats uh, just an enormous um, chunk of your savings up over time. And so that is something that I would really caution people to look at. You know, oftentimes if you look at a Fidelity or a Vanguard, um, you'll see some good low cost options um, that are, you know, sort of index funds, stuff that just really tracks the market, follow the market. Um, Van, like Fidelity even offers some of those that just have zero cost to them whatsoever. Um, but others have, have very, very low costs too. Um, but just when you go onto one of those sites, there are often just so many options to look at, so many things to choose from. Uh, and one of the first things I would recommend, again, without giving specific investment advice, but one of the first things I would look at would be how much they are charging for those funds. It's often put in there as like a net expense ratio um, 
something like that and is expressed as a percentage of the, the sort of assets that you are actually investing in it. And it might be somewhere anywhere between like 0.03% uh, for some of the most basic index funds all the way to 1% and beyond for some of the more expensive and sort of exotic funds that are out there. Um, for most people's cases, really the ones on the low end of the expense ratio are gonna be perfectly fine and uh, get you to where you need to go. Um, and so I advise people to, to really look at those fees as, as they're looking at, at certain options for a retirement plan. Douglas? Yeah, that, that's uh, a really good question. The common, common, I, I would go with, um, I would go with not failing to revisit fundamentals and knowing that a lot of financial planning that we do is circular, right? When we hit new milestones and we achieve, we never want to lose sight of the very foundational things that got us there in the first place. So, you know, our lives are dynamic, you know, even though we write financial plans that can be static at times, um, you know, things can change um, in, in a moment, you know, that's, that's life. And when you do get to those points where, you know, you've evolved, typically I find that revisit to things like cash management and cash flow, they're really boring stuff, you know, all that much more important. I can't share with you how many, you know, late 60 and 70 year olds that I've worked with who uh, have settled down in retirement. They're like, well, what do we do now? And the first thing I say is, well, let's get back to budgeting. And they're like, sir, I've just spent, you know, 35 years of my life getting to retirement through, you know, budgeting and, you know, all these things that we've been working on together. And now you're telling me to go back, you know, that now you're treating me like I'm 24 all over again. And it's just like, yeah, we got to be right. You know, we got to go see once again, you know, that this is a new regime. This is, we're starting all over here. So naturally we should kind of go back and revisit. So never lose sight, you know, of those foundational things. Always make sure your foundation is nice and tight and strong so that you can deal with inevitably, you know, uh, headwinds and tailwinds that are going to constantly come in, in and out of your life. Things change, be able to adapt to change by having control and going back to those fundamentals. Anna, what's your thought? I think one of the biggest misconceptions I find is people thinking that they're, or, or things that people miss, they think that they're going to spend less in retirement. And I find that that is not the case, right? Like you have all of this time and you, you know, you want to buy a boat or you want to buy the grandkids all the things in the world, right? And so I think, you know, having an assumption, understanding what you're spending is now, and then having an assumption that whatever you're spending money on, whether that be childcare or mortgage or whatever, is probably just going to be replaced by something else um, and planning accordingly. Well, I have a quick final around the horn, shout them out question. We were asked in a pre-submitted question, are there any states or countries that are best to retire in? And I'm just going to say that's usually a tax question and a cost of living question. So if everyone wants to throw out their answers to what are the commonly referred to, quote unquote, best places to retire when you're thinking about your money. I'll dive in. Um, I'm going to go as cliche as possible because I'm a, I will admit it, I'm a Florida man. I grew up in Florida. So if you're looking to not have to pay a lot in taxes, there are states you don't have to pay any state taxes. And Florida being one of those you know, wonderful places for wealthy people and, you know, those looking to, um, you know, preserve their wealth to go in a warm climate and, you know, play around the golf and what have you. Geez, no, Miami's a pretty cool spot, but Florida is, is definitely in the top three of places domestically uh, to go retire in for all those reasons and more. Go Gators. Ben, do you have an answer? I mean, The tax is definitely often often factored, in, and when people do ask those questions, it, it often relates to taxes too. Um, I think the type of lifestyle that is um, afforded from some of these places. I mean, again, it's it's really something that's it's a highly individual thing. Part of it is just you know where is your support system, where is your family and, and friends. Um, you know, you're not necessarily going to move to to Florida. No offense, Doug, but if if all of your your family is in Washington and um, you know, you, you would never get to, to see them unless that's what you want to do. Uh, is that, I, don't, like, I, don't, I don't talk to my family, man. <laughs> but, you know, 
just having in mind the kind of lifestyle that that you want to live. Do you want to live someplace where you can where you can walk to everywhere you want to go? Do you want to live um, someplace that is um, you know obviously moving to a place that is sort of a high cost of living is just going to mean that you know more of your retirement savings is going to be eaten up by things like housing costs and, and, and stuff. So that's just something you need to, to take into account there. Uh, the one other thing I would mention is healthcare costs vary wildly across the country. And that becomes something that is very quickly relevant. Uh, you know, the older that you get, the, the further into retirement that you get. And so, you know, that is, is one other thing to consider um, is not just where are you going to be paying taxes? What is the, the cost of housing around here? But what is the health, if, if you're going to be really staying somewhere for the long haul, what is the cost of healthcare in, in one of these places? Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I can't, I unfortunately can't call out specific states on maybe, maybe some of my colleagues can if they, they are well better studied in this than I am, but um, you know, places that do have, have lower cost of healthcare, um, that's also just gonna be a consideration. Anna, any last points on this topic? Yeah, um, my, my, I have two points, but my first thought was, you know, there's a reason everybody goes to Arizona and Florida, right? That's probably taxes and weather, right? Um, but I, I think what, I don't like to advise people to make decisions based on taxes and cost of living, right? Get That gets back to what Ben is talking about. Um, your quality of life, the lifestyle you actually want to lead, I think is much more important for what's a good place to retire. That's very subjective. I hate snow. And so I probably wouldn't move to like Alaska, right? But that might be paradise for somebody else. Fine. Um, you know, that's, that's per, a very personal decision. And I think unless you're in a position where you are, if retirement is imminent and you don't have enough time to catch up, which I, I would challenge you that you, that you do, but um, that's the only time where I would recommend people make that decision based on that. Well, I wanna say thank you so much to all of our panelists. We have reached our times and thank you so much for everyone who has tuned in. I just wanna say a final point, one question that got raised was, do artists and writers ever retire? And I think going all the way back to the very first sentence really that was uttered is having a conversation about retirement doesn't just have to be the classic, you never work again a day in your life. It's more of reaching that point of financial independence. So you get to choose what projects you take, what articles you're writing, what stories you're writing, what you wanna share. It just gives you a ton of flexibility. So that's really what we hope that we inspired you to do here today. There will be an email going out with information about all of our wonderful panelists, where you can reach them, resources they recommend. And thank you all for tuning into this webinar.